I, I tried to talk a lot about how amazing the river was at the beginning uh, of our event today because it is amazing and it's beautiful and, and there's a lot to celebrate. But let's be honest, when you have a state of the river event, uh, you talk about a lot of problems. Um, factory farms, uh, you may hear those referred to as CAFOs, which stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations, are certainly one of the Cape Fear River's uh, biggest and, and most persistent problems. As Dana said, uh, this has been around for as long as I've been working with Cape Fear River Watch, uh, and it is a very difficult and slow fight, and the winds are small, and the progress is incremental. Um, but we just keep fighting. So, uh, for, for anybody that doesn't know what a factory farm is, uh, that term again, CAFO, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation, is a, is a regulatory term. Uh, and it basically just defines uh, a facility that houses an enormous amount of animals. We'll be talking about large CAFOs, uh, greater than 2,500 pigs, uh, over 55 pounds, over 125,000 chickens, uh, and over 55,000 turkeys. Um, on these facilities, uh, the animals are housed exclusively indoors. They never go outside to forage. They never see the sun. They're frequently housed in crates or cages. Their movement is restricted. The feed is brought in. The feed is carefully uh, formulated and administered to promote growth. Uh, because these facilities are trying to grow animals as quickly as possible um, so that they can sell them uh, and, and make money. So uh, a, a hog or a chicken that's raised in one of these facilities uh, grows much, much more rapidly than it would if it were uh, grown on a farm 50 years ago. Uh, there are all kinds of feed additives, pharmaceuticals, uh, that are designed to, to control disease. Imagine... Um, if, if we were in a CAFO right now, I mean, we would be in the nicest, most luxurious CAFO ever. Uh, the, we, have, we would have what would seem like just um, continents of space between us. Um, and imagine how quickly uh, disease could spread even in this environment. Imagine if, if we were 10 or 20 times more compacted. Um, the waste from these facilities is deposited in the barns because, of course, the animals never leave the barns. Uh, so in, in hog farms, swine farms, the waste falls through holes in the floor and is flushed out uh, into what is uh, kind of, I think, maybe a, a little bit of a misnomer, a lagoon. It's more of a cesspool. Uh, it's flushed out into that lagoon and it sits there. In a, in a poultry facility, it's scraped out with big front end loaders and put into big piles. This slide kind of tells the story of CAFOs in North Carolina and really across the country. You can see the steep decline in the number of farms uh, from the 1950s onwards, and you can see the very steep uh, incline in the number of animals on that much fewer number of farms. And so that was fueled by um, consolidation in the meatpacking industry. This was an attempt to buy, by what are called integrators uh, to get big or get out, right? So they control the entire system. They control the slaughterhouse. They control the feed. They control the contracts between these growers. Um, and, and these names are ones we all recognize. It's Smithfield. It's Tyson. It's Butterball. It's Purdue. It's Prestige. Sanderson Farms. These are the integrators uh, of, of the animal agriculture industry. And, and that process of consolidation and vertical integration has pushed out many of the small farmers. You know, we no longer see tens of thousands of small farmers growing 10 or 12 pigs. We now see uh, these massive operations with, with thousands and thousands of animals. And this map shows, again, the Cape Fear Basin. Kind of think back, if you will, to that map I showed earlier where uh, the Cape Fear Basin kind of cut up through the heart of the state. It was centered uh, right here around this big mass of pink and yellow dots. Every pink dot in this image is a hog farm. Every yellow dot in this image is a poultry farm. And you can see that uh, Duplin and Sampson County, Duplin the headwaters of the Northeast Cape Fear, Sampson the headwaters of the Black River, uh, are where these facilities are most concentrated. Five million pigs just in the Cape Fear Basin. Over 125 million chickens. That number is probably much higher now. These are, these are slightly older numbers. Uh, and 22 million turkeys. 
The reason that number, the reason that poultry number is uh, probably an underestimate, uh, I mentioned this earlier, just this year, uh, North Carolina has become the nation's leading producer of poultry. We've been moving up this list for like the last five years. Um, and so we now top every other state in the country as far as, as poultry production. This is a, um, a Google Earth image. I love Google Earth. Um, I've kind of augmented it a little bit. Every single red circle you see in this image is a CAFO. Uh, there's 150 of them, if anybody's counting. Uh, I've also highlighted the streams, and you can kind of see the way these, these things are situated. You can see the way they're frequently right along streamlines here in the headwaters, right? This is what it looks like um, when you get a little closer. There's the hog lagoon, there's the hog barns. Here it is surrounded by water, again here. This is uh, Patrick and I, Patrick's back here, and we fly a lot. Um, because that's frequently the only way that you can really get a good idea of what's happening on the ground with these facilities. And, and we see these things just surrounded uh, by streams and wetlands uh, throughout the lower Cape Fear Basin. And I wanted to take just a second and kind of walk you through it because it's, it, th these things are, are hard to see. The process is hard to understand. Most of us don't, don't understand exactly what goes on at these facilities. So I wanted to take just a minute and kind of walk you through it so you do know. Um, so we're looking down now at a facility here. There's the lagoon. They're frequently this kind of pink color. There's the barns. This is the spray field. Uh, this is a stream here running through a large wetland. Um, this is what's happening on that facility. Those barns, are, are the, they have flushed, and they have flushed that waste out into this lagoon. It's piling up in that lagoon. There's no treatment there. And then they turn on giant pumps that, that run water to these sprinklers. You can see the sprinkler heads, the little circles of water here. And I apologize, I'm not showing it on both sides. Um, so hogs in here, waste in here, and then waste sprayed out onto that field. Sometimes the sprayers are different. Sometimes they're big hose reel sprayers. They're like fire hoses uh, attached to a sprinkler that gets moved around. Uh, sometimes they're pivot head sprayers. The result is frequently the same way too much waste applied to the landscape, way too much waste than the landscape could ever possibly absorb. So this is, um, a, there's a pivot sprayer, these are hose reel sprayers spraying hog waste onto this field from this lagoon. Uh, you can see how much water is there. You can actually see that they've been spraying too much waste long enough that they've created new streams. This is now the headwaters of a stream somewhere in the Cape Fear Basin. That water runs off into this ditch and eventually into the Northeast Cape Fear. Uh, this facility was issued a notice of violation. It would have looked something like this. This is a more recent notice of violation after uh, Patrick and I flew and reported a facility. Um, you can see that, oops, you can see that here. We visited a farm in response to a reported discharge. Uh, so. That was Patrick putting together an email with a bunch of photos that we took uh, and a bunch of information. These are the four violations. Failure to prevent a discharge into a waterway. Vi uh, failure to notify the state about a known discharge. Failure to inspect their spray field system to make sure it's working properly. And failure to notify the public who uses that waterway downstream. We see a lot of these. Two other ones, we've seen many more. Poultry is a similar story. Um, it's a different animal. The waste is a little bit different. It's dry litter, uh, but it still is, is an enormous amount of it. And these big piles frequently left out in the fields and eventually um, spread on the landscape again, uh, spread at rates that far exceed the landscape's ability to take up those nutrients. You're not supposed to leave poultry piles of litter uncovered in the field for more than 15 days. That's one of the, the very few regulations, and this is the most common thing we see, are these piles left out for weeks or months, and in some cases even years at a time, partially covered or completely uncovered. Again, when it rains, this waste washes off into the, to the ditches and the streams around these fields and into creeks and eventually into our river. And that's when the system is working the way it's intended to work. 
That's when everything is happening the way it's intended to. That's when, that's when the, the farms are following minimal regulations. Um, when hurricanes come, the whole system goes haywire. When hurricanes come, uh, whole lagoons rupture and, and discharge their entire contents, including the sludge, into waterways, which is what happened here in Hurricane Florence. Entire farms are covered up. Animals in those barns drown. The lagoons around those barns are completely covered. Here, poultry facilities uh, are covered uh, and discharging whatever is left in there into a community downstream, into homes and churches and schools. And these fields that, that are, um, you know, prior to storms, these farmers say, oh my gosh, we've got a storm coming, we've got to empty these lagoons, so they pump, they pump a ton of liquid or they spread a ton of waste onto these fields, and then a tropical storm comes and washes that waste off into waterways. So what's the big deal? You know, why is this such a big deal? The industry would just say, well, we're just fertilizing crops. We're just, this is just good old-fashioned fertilizer. Um, that's... Uh, that's a misrepresentation and a, and a pretty dramatic one. I'll tell you how I, I try to explain to people the scope of the problem. There's about 10 million hogs in eastern North Carolina. There's about 10 million people in all of North Carolina. So I want you to try to imagine if we shifted all the people in North Carolina east of I-95, if we put all 10 million people in North Carolina east of I-95, so just think about that for a second. All of us living in one part of the state now remember that a hog produces, uh, because they're essentially force-fed, they produce about 10 times as much waste as a human. So in human waste equivalents, we, we kind of have 100 million people now living all east of I-95. Imagine what that would look like, 100 million people east of I-95 all producing waste. Now what we're going to do with that waste is we're going to put it in a big hole in our yard, and then we're going to spray it untreated all across the landscape. Imagine what would happen if, if we proposed that was the way we were going to dispose of that waste. It's an absolutely insane idea, but that's what happens with swine waste. And right now, we're just piling poultry waste on top of that swine waste. We're now the nation's leading producer of poultry, and that poultry is centered in the Cape Fear Basin in the same two counties where the, the swine industry is centered. And so we're just stacking poultry waste on top of swine waste. Animal waste is not good stuff. Uh, to come in contact with. It's got a ton of bacteria, E. coli, enterococcus, fisteria. Um, coming into contact with that bacteria can cause illness. Arsenic, arsenoids, and other heavy metals are put into animal feed to prevent disease, disease outbreaks. That's why the Lower Cape Fear River uh, is impaired for copper. Why would there be copper in the Lower Cape Fear River? Most people think, oh, it must be bottom pain off boats. It's not. It's copper that's in swine feed. High levels of nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus can facilitate toxic algal, algal blooms. So they can facilitate regular algal blooms, which take the dissolved oxygen out of the water, but they can also produce toxic algal blooms, which actually release a toxin into the water. And then there's air pollution issues as well. Ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, uh, and other gases uh, can impair air quality around these facilities. Lagoons and land application fields can, can contaminate groundwater as well, so these lagoons are frequently not lined or they're lined with clay and those clay liners are failing after 20 or 25 years. Uh, the big piles of poultry litter that we see that are left out sometimes for a year or more at a time, as, as those piles just sit there and soak into groundwater, they can contaminate groundwater that way. Antibiotic resistance, you know, we, we all know that, that Americans and, and human beings in general use just a ton of pharmaceuticals. We're kind of blown away when we stop and think about how much pharmaceuticals we use. 80% of the pharmaceuticals produced in this country go to CAFOs. We only use 20% and we know how much we use. Cramming that many animals into a small space and then uh, using subtherapeutic antibiotics basically just creates superbugs. And, and we know from, from countless research studies that that is happening on CAFOs and that that is fueling this antibiotic-resistant bacteria that we come into contact with more and more today. Climate change impacts. Of course, we know that livestock production has a huge impact on climate change, especially when it's done in the CAFO model. And today, even after Hurricane Matthew, after Hurricane Florence, you still see CAFOs being built in the floodplain, being rebuilt in the floodplain even after they've flooded, and more are coming every day. Patrick and I see a new 
poultry CAFO being built almost, if not, every single time we fly. And then finally, we don't have time to talk about all of these kind of impacts that, that aren't specifically related to water quality, but, but rural economies are suffering because, because there's, there's no way that any other industry is going to walk into Duplin or Sampson County and try to do business in that kind of atmosphere. The workers on these facilities and the workers in slaughterhouses, we've got the largest slaughterhouse on planet Earth uh, right upstream in Tar Heel. We've got the largest poultry slaughterhouse on planet Earth just over the line in the lumber basin. Uh, conditions there are horrid. Uh, we saw that highlighted, especially during COVID. There's animal welfare issues. There's consumer health issues. We could talk about, you know, we could do a whole seminar on any one of these. And one really important one uh, that I do want to talk about for a minute is that I don't know of any better example of environmental injustice than, than the story of factory farms in North Carolina. Um, in Duplin and in Sampson County, factory farms are frequently located in low-wealth communities and low-wealth communities uh, of color. And so, you know, imagine if you can, all that waste I talked about, and then imagine having to live right next to it. Uh, these communities are disproportionately impacted by that waste and the impacts of that waste on their, on their surface water and their air quality and their drinking water. And, and if you look at the research, new research coming out of Duke University and, and, and other well-known universities, they show that controlling for all other factors that the residents of Duplin and Sampson County that live next to CAFOs get sicker sooner, they stay sicker longer, their sicknesses are worse, and their lives are shorter than compared to people who don't live around CAFOs. Their lives are shorter, they die sooner, their quality of life is worse than the people who don't have to live around CAFOs. So you might think, well, why, why haven't we done something? Well, we did do something. Uh, residents around these facilities got together and they filed lawsuits. Uh, nuisance lawsuits under, under an existing North Carolina law that allows you to file a lawsuit if your neighbor is destroying your life, basically. You know, like if I went out and started pumping raw waste into my neighbor's yard, it seems, it seems reasonable that you might be able to say, you have to stop that. That's a nuisance. You're ruining my yard. You're ruining my life. So these, these Residents of Duplin and Sampson County got together and they did that. They filed five lawsuits. There were five jury trials. Jury trials mean that a jury of your peers, 12 people from, from your community that are vetted by attorneys on both sides, have to hear all the evidence presented by your attorneys and all the evidence presented by your opposition's attorneys. And you get to pick all the best cases. And you get to try to pick the best attorneys that you can. So it's teachers and firefighters and farmers and housewives and truck drivers, and anything else you can imagine. And in each of those five cases, in every single example, that jury of 12 people found Smithfield guilty. Not, not 12 hand-picked, crazy environmentalists like me, not 12, you know, environmental justice advocates, 12 members of that community picked by attorneys on both sides, they found them guilty 100% of the time. Remember that. But this is a very powerful industry. This is, this is farm receipts in North Carolina. It's almost $11 billion. This is a little bit old. It's, it's probably a good bit higher than that now, partially based on that explosion of poultry. These numbers are going up. If you just look at confined animals, you've got broilers there, turkeys there, swine there, and layers here. You're looking at close to $7 billion of influence. And what can $7 billion of influence buy you? A lot. It can buy you a whole lot in the North Carolina General Assembly. It can buy you bills that are introduced to do a lot of things that protect and support the agriculture industry. I'll just go over a few of them. There have been laws passed in the last 10 years that limit what can be revealed about citizens' complaints. So if I make a citizen complaint and I say, my neighbor's left his poultry litter uncovered in this field for two months now, and then I call back a month later and I say, this pile is still here. What are you guys doing? Can you please just tell me something about what's happening? The response you will get from DEQ because of a law passed by the General Assembly is, we can't discuss this with you. And I'll say, it's, my, it's right next to me. It's my neighbor. We can't discuss it with you. It's against the law. 
a criminalized reporting of crimes. They make it illegal to report illegal activity on these facilities. They limit the ability to conduct drone surveillance because the one thing that you don't want is the public to understand what's going on on these facilities if you own one. That's why Patrick and I fly in an airplane because it's legal to do so. Reduces the ability to file nuisance lawsuits. So remember the nuisance cases that they lost 100% of the time? You know what they did? They went back and they rewrote the laws. They introduced two laws three sessions ago in the General Assembly and they rewrote the laws to say you can't file nuisance lawsuits anymore because every time you do, we lose. They reduce the budgets of environmental regulatory agencies. So if DEQ uh, is, is going to go out and inspect your farm and tell you you've got a problem, what's an easy way to fix that problem? You just get rid of the DEQ inspector. You cut the budget by half. DEQ's budget's been slashed. Uh, and they're less inspectors, and they have less of a budget. They can't fly. So, so nonprofits like Cape Fear River Watch are flying because DEQ can't do it anymore because their budget's so low. They don't have people to review permits. Um, they can prohibit additional regulation of factory farms. There have been bills introduced that would, that would require a permit for poultry. Right now there is no permit for poultry. There's no permit for poultry and we're the leading state in the country in poultry production and yet you don't need a permit to produce poultry. How, how crazy is that? There was, a, there was a bill introduced that never got out of committee. It never it never even legitimately got to committee. And then, of course, there's a hundred in runs around the existing regulations and, and loopholes and ways to get out of any type of environmental regulation. So what does that mean? It means industry can just act with impunity. They can continue to rack up waste management violations. We'll see more. I think Patrick and I are going to fly next week. We'll see more. We'll report them. Um, they'll... they'll, they'll partake in sampling fraud. So, you know, they, they're required to submit a sample of their lagoon. A couple of years ago, there was a, a, a big kind of fraud ring busted where this guy was taking 50 samples in a day from a single lagoon and reporting it as uh, samples from all other kinds of lagoons. Um, the, the record keeping on these facilities it can be done, this could, this could be the record of spraying at a, at a swine lagoon. You could just write it on a little sheet of paper and stick it in there. It could be done any time. The inspections are pre-announced, and there's only one a year. So, and when we do make complaints, uh, it's frequently very difficult to see that those complaints are actually acted on. And then even when they are acted on, the fines and penalties for violating the state's rules are minimal. So, there's a whole lot to this issue. Uh, and I wanted to, to talk about this just for a second because this is kind of a new piece of it. And uh, you may have heard a little bit about biogas. Um, if, you've, if you've heard um, the, the swine industry's commercials that are a lot like the good neighbor commercials of Camores, uh, you might think that biogas is going to save the whole planet. That we're going to, thank God for biogas, we're all going to be okay. Um, now biogas is here. Biogas is a masterful greenwashing campaign. Biogas does absolutely nothing to change the lagoon and spray field system in place on swine capos in North Carolina. It adds an additional lagoon which is covered. It introduces a new source of revenue for that facility when they sell that gas to a power company who's required to make a certain amount of power from hog biogas or, or other renewables. It introduces pipelines across these communities that I talked about that are already, already disproportionately impacted uh, by environmental issues. And it still continues to spray hog waste all over spray fields next to people's homes. In those lawsuits, scientists went inside people's homes and they swabbed the inside of their homes. And they found fecal bacteria from pigs inside every home they swabbed. That's still happening with biogas. It's just making more money for these facilities. And we're doing nothing to make them actually change the way they manage their waste. We're just allowing them to capture the methane and make more money. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas. Reducing the amount of methane that escapes into the atmosphere is a good goal, but the fact of the matter is that these types of systems and these pipeline networks frequently leak as much methane as they prevent from getting out. And we've known that, we, we know that from looking at fracking wells, 
uh, and natural gas pipelines all over the country. And so, just to make things even more depressing, nobody's figured out a real easy fix here. That's why we've been fighting these things for, for 25 years. There's no simple silver bullet. Um, there's a few things that we could do that would make, make the issue a little bit better. Uh, and, and we work on these. Banning new factory farms. There's already a moratorium on swine farms in North Carolina. Uh, we already have more than anywhere else on the planet, so it's a little too, too late for swine, but at least we're not seeing more. Uh, but we need to ban new poultry facilities because we don't even understand what the impacts were. We tried to pass a study bill that wouldn't even get out of a committee just to ask DEQ to look at the impacts of, um, of the poultry industry on North Carolina's waterways and communities, and they wouldn't even let, let the study bill get out of, out of committee. We can enforce existing laws a little bit better. So, you know, I don't know how many piles of poultry litter we've seen that have been out for more than 15 days, but we know there haven't been that many notices of violation issued. We could eliminate the stormwater exemption that would, that would mean that farms can no longer say that, that they don't have to worry about waste that runs off of their facilities during storms. We could hold integrators responsible for the waste. So, so the way the integrators have rigged the system is that they, they put... All the valuable stuff in their control. They own the valuable stuff. They own the feed and they own the pigs. And, and they put the risky stuff in the hands of these growers. So the growers own the waste. And the best way to increase your profit is to reduce your expenses. And the best place to reduce your expenses is by taking shortcuts on your waste management. If we made integrators responsible for waste on these facilities, you can bet that since they control the entire industry, they'd start to clean it up. We could do federal investment in alternatives to CAFOs, and we could start to buy out CAFOs that are located in the floodplain, and we could start to have a realistic uh, understanding of what floodplain means, right? We know that the floodplain, as it's, as it's um, defined, is different than what floods during a storm. We can encourage smaller scale uh, sustainable farms by breaking the monopoly of these integrators, uh, and then we can do that on the personal level by changing the way we eat. So this is way too small for anybody here to see, but you can go to our website and you can find a long list of local sustainable farms that you can go to and you can say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to decide personally that I'm not going to support CAFOs anymore and I'm going to try to support small-scale sustainable agriculture. And that's the end of the CAFO presentation. <laughs>